We are ready? Great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this hearing uh, of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. Uh, my name is Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer and I'm the chair of this committee and we are formally in session. Uh, this afternoon we're gonna be discussing a very important topic uh, and that is the closure of the Court Square Library. Uh, this coming Saturday, February 15th, it's hard to believe, will be the last day of public service for the Court Square Library. And after that, uh, it will close with no uh, date or uh, even exact time frame on when it will be open. Uh, it goes without saying that libraries are some of the most accessible and democratic institutions in the city. Uh, and it's an absolute shame to see one closing, uh, particularly at a time when uh, New Yorkers need these spaces and in a community that is growing by leaps and bounds uh, and uh, at a time when seemingly this neighborhood needs the library more than ever, um, it is closing. So we're here to address uh, this closure and uh, to better understand how we got uh, to this point. Understanding how we got here uh, with this branch closing in a few days, uh, I hope would also help inform the process that uh, the city's libraries, and in particular the Queens Public Library, undergo uh, in the face of changes uh, to its physical plants, leases that may involve its branches, uh, and the changing demographics and nature of our neighborhoods in New York City. Uh, the library's closure and its status uh, should come as a surprise to no one. Uh, two years ago, in the spring of 2018, uh, the community and uh, others, including my office, began to engage the Queens Public Library uh, on their plans to uh, continue service uh, in the face of a lease expiring at the current location. Uh, because of the advocacy of the Friends of the Court Square Library uh, and negotiations with building owners, uh, in the spring of 2019, we all celebrated the extension of the lease. Uh, but uh, we all knew that that extension would only enable uh, the public library more time to find a new location. Everyone there knew how much time we had uh, and what needed to be done. But the question, therefore, is simple. What happened in the intervening uh, months? How did we get here? Uh, and what did the library do uh, to make sure that this community was not denied library service? It's absolutely unacceptable that a library would close in the city of New York. Uh, and I believe that this is a failure on the part of the Queen's Public Library. Uh, only when it was clear that this library was closing uh, and the community rose up and expressed uh, outrage, uh, did there seem to be an increasing effort to find a space, but it was too late. Court Square is one of the fastest growing neighborhoods in the entire country and that we are reducing city services, taking them offline in this neighborhood uh, should be abhorrent and shocking. And I know the Queens Public Library has talked about funding um, and, and money in relation to this. And money is very important. But I wanna uh, cite a few different statistics. Um, with respect to funding for the Queen's Public Library in the last five years um, and what we have done in the city of New York. Uh, in fiscal year 2016, overall funding for the Queen's Public Library, this is expense funding, was $101,696,000. Of that, $95,586,000 was baselined, i.e. permanent. The next year, funding went up to 105,159,000, virtually all of that baselined. The next year, FY 2018, 
Funding went up again, several million dollars, 108 million, 597,000. Baselining went up again, 107 million, 844,000 dollars. Huge jump in FY19, overall funding to the Queens Public Library, 115 million, 808,000. Baselining, 112 million, 828,500. This past fiscal year, record funding for the Queens Public Library, $122,021,000. Of that, $117,465,500 baselined. So, this is not a question of the library not receiving adequate resources. Certainly, any nonprofit institution in the city of New York would want even more funding, and I want even more funding for the Queens Public Library. But the library's received record funding incredible increases, and baselining to match that. Uh, and yet, the Queens Public Library uh, didn't uh, make sure that we had, and they had, planned for and then allocated the resources to make sure we had permanent and continuous library service. Uh, that, to me, is unacceptable. Um, so, the closure of the library in light of this uh, increasing resources is even more befuddling. Uh, it is true that the library had a great deal for a few decades, um, but that deal ended and uh, Savannah did not want and had no interest in maintaining this community facility. Bad on them for not understanding the importance of a library and how it could actually, I would think, increase uh, the value of their property. But uh, it was then incumbent upon uh, the library when it knew it didn't have a willing partner to come up with a solution for this community that did not include closure of a public library branch. Um, so we want to know many things, uh, and I'm anxious to hear from the president and CEO of the Queens Public Library, um, but did the library do enough uh, to prevent this from happening? Uh, was there the sense of urgency that I think all of us uh, who love libraries and love this community understand? Um, uh, did the library move too late uh, to find what we all know is needed to happen here? Uh, and, and this is something I've certainly heard from some folks in the community and a question that obviously I will ask too, was the library okay with this library closing? Did the Queens Public Library accept this as something that they were okay with it? Uh, either way, we find ourselves in an untenable position. And uh, I know that there are members of the community who are gonna speak, and I know that the President and CEO uh, is here to testify as well. I wanna recognize uh, members of the committee, Mark Joni from the Bronx and Joe Borelli from Staten Island, and I know other members are coming as well. I wanna thank, uh, my staff, including Jack Bernadovitz, my legislative director, Matt Wallace, my chief of staff, committee counsel, Brenda McKinney, and our legislative policy analyst, Christy Dwyer, and our principal finance analyst, Alia Ali. Uh, with that, I will ask uh, President CEO Walcott uh, to deliver his statement, and then we'll do questions and hear from the members of the community as well. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon to you and to the members of the Council and to the staff and to the public as well. Uh, my name is Dennis Walcott, as you indicated, President and CEO of the Queens Public Library. Uh, thank you for inviting me to testify on the status of the Court Square Library. While the library is scheduled last day, as you indicated, of public service is this coming Saturday. Uh, the lease runs until the end of March, but it will require us to do a lot of work to uh, close out the library. Uh, we want to re first to reassure the community, to reassure uh, the public as well as to the elected officials. We are truly dedicated to maintaining a court square library. We have a commitment to do that internally and I want to make sure we say that publicly as well. 
I appreciate the committee's desire to learn about Queens Public Library's response to the termination of our lease, the challenges involved, and where we are today. And with that, you know, I'll be glad to entertain any questions or respond to some of the points you raised. So since this is my first oversight hearing, uh, I will go by the way you'd guide me on how to proceed, sir. So thank you. So uh, uh, I'm shocked at how short your testimony is. Um, uh, you have been before this committee many times, and you are certainly a veteran. Not as an oversight committee, though. It's uh, a little bit different. Uh, we've had oversight hearings on public libraries, non-budgetary oversight hearings. But either way, I would just say uh, uh, the testimony is uh, bereft of real, any, any real meaningful information on, on what's happened and what uh, uh, the library has done to maintain public library service in Court Square. Certainly, we are going to ask lots of questions, but I'm, I'm surprised you didn't come to this public testimony before the public, before the press, before the community, and address anything. It is literally a paragraph. As you indicated that you plan to ask a lot of questions, and uh, I am here prepared to answer every and any question that you have to the best of my ability. And as you well know that we have made a major commitment in looking for space. We've seen space throughout the district. We've talked to your office as well about space and you have talked to us about space. You and I have had conversations before around Amazon when Amazon was taking a look at the building where Savannah is located as far as potential library as well as the Fauci building. And so we've done a lot as far as pursuing potential space uh, for Court Square. I'm pretty confident that we will have space uh, hopefully identified in the very near future. Currently, uh, we have a number of sites that are very interesting, but I think you raised a quick po an important point as far as the price per square foot. Uh, we have several lease sites, as you probably know. We have Left Rack, we have Fresh Meadows, we have Pominock, and the price per square foot in those areas in the libraries are totally different than where it is in Court Square. On average, we've been looking at a price per square foot of roughly $100 per square foot. We've seen a couple at $80 per square foot. And while we have, thankfully, as a result of your leadership, benefited in the budget, as you also well know, last year, uh, we had a peg before the city council came to the rescue uh, and took the peg off the table to receive additional funds as well. And with that program to eliminate GAP, we were taking very serious looks as far as potential layoffs and other type of service cuts to respond to that. And as the CEO of the Queens Public Library, it is my responsibility not just to plan for this budget year, but also in moving out into the future budget years. And I think that's where we may have a little tension as far as the budget figures as they exist right now versus what will be in the future. And I cannot position the Queens Public Library to pay roughly $80 to $100 per square foot and as well uh, the build out costs that can average up to a million dollars. So with all that being said, I mean, I am totally prepared to answer any question that so you let, may have. So let me ask you some questions. Please. But I just want to say that regardless of what the property values or price per square footage is in any particular neighborhood in Queens, you lead an organization that is called upon to serve every single one of those neighborhoods equally, whether the price per square foot is very low in a neighborhood or the price per square foot is higher in a certain neighborhood. That's a challenge, I understand, but you can't point to the more expensive land in Long Island City as a reason not to provide that community with a library. No, I, I, the I'm sorry. The issue before you is to make sure that even given the challenges uh, and the disparities in a borough where some neighborhoods have lower squice, uh, uh, lower price per square footage, some have higher, your job is to figure out how to provide library service for all of them equally. And that's what's not happening here. So I wanna just talk a little bit about this library and, and hope you can share some information sure. which is not in your testimony. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, gate count at Court Square? Um, uh, how many people use the Court Square Library? Rough. Has that number been going up? Has that number been going down? Like, what does that look like? We've seen roughly 100,000 people who come through our doors at Court Square, and that number has gone up. Uh, as you well know, Court Square is a library that's in great demand. I think where we may have lost some of our customers, and it's not totally reflected in the gate count, or some of the people who may have been in the old Citibank building, 
And as the Citibank building has been clearing out, we don't have the same traffic from there. But as you well know and the public knows that the population in that community is growing like crazy. And so we have roughly 3,600 square feet uh, for the Court Square Library. And every square foot is in use. And as a result of you and others as well, uh, over the last number of years, we were able to expand the space there. And since I took over as president and CEO, we also expanded the services, because originally it was Monday through Friday, and now it's Monday through Saturday, and meeting the sixth day. And even after the sixth day had been passed by the city council and the executive side, Court Square still had not been providing that. And that then expanded as a result of all of us working together on that. So the numbers have been going up, but it's roughly 100,000 people that come through the door. So gate count is up. More and more people are using uh, the Court Square Library. And let me recognize uh, Councilmember Francisco Moya from Queens uh, has joined us on the committee. Uh, circulation rising, program attendance programs rising. Metrics are good. I mean, the program numbers are going up at Court Square as well as throughout the system. Circulation has basically been somewhat even, and you know we have circulation going up and down depending on the month and the year, but CIRC has been pretty good at Court Square as well. So again, all the metrics justify us maintaining a Court Square library, and there is never any question in my mind as far as maintaining a Court Square library. At the same time, I have a fiduciary responsibility to plan for the out years. If we're gonna get a good lease, we're going to have to go for a 10 and 10 or 15 year lease in negotiating a deal. And for me to talk about negotiating a deal based on $100 per square foot is unacceptable. And so, yes, my leadership is required to make sure I look at a variety of spots to find the best spot to deal with a new library being in Court Square. But there's a lot of balancing acts going along with that. And so we've seen some interesting spots. I mean, we have three spots that really have been uh, piquing our interest. One spot I think I may have referred to uh, when we had a conversation before uh, that, while I didn't identify the specific spot, but has three contiguous uh, spaces next to each other, one 1,800, one 2,100, and one 2,500 square feet. And our goal would be possibly taking a look at collapsing the 1800 and the 2100 to make a 3900 square foot library. So we're negotiating there and taking a look at that. So I want to, I will, I will get to the sites you're looking at now and, and where we find ourselves now. But I, I do want to go back a little bit uh, because now we're in crisis mode. Uh, we're losing a library and, and the, the, Public Library is clearly uh, uh, talking to lots of people, uh, looking at lots of spaces, but no matter what you ultimately decide on, uh -huh. no matter what is possible, we're going to go a period of time without uh, continuous library service in Court Square. That and, is correct. And we don't know exactly what time frame that is because you are not even close to signing a lease. And well, you don't know that. I mean, we potentially we may be, you never know. We're in conversations, that's why I was focusing on that aspect in response we'll, to the question. We'll get to it, but I wanna actually talk about what got us to this point and how uh, I certainly believe, and I know lots of people in the community believe, that uh, we had time to actually never get to this point. And, and what did the library do uh, when it knew that it was faced with this, right? So. In uh, the spring of 18, when we realized uh, we were uh, coming up against the end of the lease. Now, yes, there were extensions. There were two extensions, right? Um, mm, one, but maybe two. Well, I thought one, but go ahead. So yeah. since the spring of 2018, at a minimum, we knew we were mm -hmm. going to be uh, 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 discontinued in terms of what the building owners wanted to do to the building. In the spring of 2018, what did the library do? Could you walk us through from uh, the spring of 2018 sure. what the library was doing to identify alternative sites uh, and secure the, the necessary space to continue library service? Because the sense, uh, uh, Mr. Walcott, is that the library knew, at a minimum in the spring of 2018, that it was in danger of losing this library. Yes, there were a couple of extensions uh, that were granted, 
but that in the meantime, the library didn't do anything to find a suitable alternative location. So now here you are at City Hall, and I would ask you, what did the library do in sure. the spring of 2018 to secure additional sites? Yes, you're looking at multiple sites now. Well, I can you respond to your question sites. easily. Yep, I'm not finished asking the oh. question. And what did you do then? Uh, were you actively looking at sites then and for the last two years? Uh, or did you just start uh, in the last several weeks in earnest to find a location? Well, one, I totally disagree with your premise in using the term last couple of weeks. I mean, we've been looking for space for a good while. And back then, in two it, then tell you, me said, what does a good you while said the last look couple like? of weeks. Now, that is a total mischaracterization. Then of tell what me we, the truth. What does it look like? Well, I'm like? trying to, and then you. Okay. So but give us the dates then. If you're, so if you're, you're asking if you're about hold on, hold, exception to You're asking several about weeks, 2018. Tell us what you're, you're asking looking. about 2018, so I'm going to respond about 2018. I think you're aware that, one, the shifting of the burden to the library is needed to be addressed in a different way. We were basically evicted by Savannah, and we all agree to that. Do, am I correct? I mean, we all agree to that, but yet we had pursued Savannah and Citibank in talking to them about maintaining a library there, and we put significant time back in 2018 in talking to Savannah, and you and I have talked about that. And so Savannah, at one point, didn't respond. We continued to pursue. We talked to Citibank. We had parallel discussions, both with Citibank and Savannah, around maintaining the library. Eventually, we met with Brian Reaver at Court Square Library to talk about the future of the library at Court Square. And all this was taking place during 2018. And Savannah made some noises, maybe, but in reality, they said no, but come back to us later on and we started to see the reality that we were not going to have a place there. So then we retained a broker to take a look at space. Part of the broker's responsibility was trying to find space in a reasonable price point. And once we found out that that reasonable price point wasn't available, then we upped the price point and went to another broker in 2019. And so we were very serious about that. But also parallel to that, uh, if you remember, I yeah, you know you do, that part of the discussion was also with Amazon, which was just going to be the major leaseholder in the Savannah building as well. And we had a very productive discussion with Amazon at the Long Island City Library talking about the library, the move uh, where we are, and building a library for the future. Unfortunately, that did not materialize. And then we found that another uh, tenant would be one of the major tenants after Amazon decided not to relocate into Long Island City, and that was Centene. And we reached out to Centene and pursued them as well as far as the potential of having a sublease with them in the building. Also, to put it in context, that with Savannah itself, their vision was to make uh, their building now the Time Warner Center of Long Island City. So they really didn't have any opportunity for us to even have, I think, an, ex an acceptable opportunity for us to even talk about having a library there. But so with the two-week timeline chair that you laid out, I totally disagree with that. We were very serious in 2018 very serious in 2019. We expanded the breadth of the price point that we were looking at to try to find suitable space once we saw the reality of how much per square foot uh, space was in the area itself. And then we continued to expand our search as far as looking at including me going out uh, in 2019 and early middle of 2019 to look at spots as well. Uh, and I went to the area, talked about that when we met with some of the friends. And so we've been pursuing it extremely diligently as far as the future of a Court Square library, but also, whether we agree or not, the balancing act that I feel is responsible as far as the moving forward. And then also, thanks to your leadership, uh, we were able to potentially have a deal with Tavros as well, and having a library in the future. And that would be roughly four years off, give or take, depending on the construction timeline. And then with that, 
part of that conversation. Uh, we were looking at different price points with Tavros. If we wanted a basement, it would be roughly $10 per square foot. If we wanted the main floor, it would be give or take $55 per square. And then if we wanted to go above the for, uh, main floor, it would be roughly $45 per square foot. So we started that discussion as well. And we were in discussions with Tavros and Mark Weprin and others around the future of a court square library. So those are the steps that we've taken. And we've looked at a number of sites in the period of time that you identified. We've looked at roughly 20 sites plus, And I personally have looked at roughly 10 sites of those 20 sites. And some sites have ranged from 2,500 square feet up to 7,500 square feet over the last several years. So we have been very diligent as far as the process is concerned and looking for sites. And unfortunately, so far, have not found a site that we can say we're in a point of signing a lease today. But hopefully, very soon, we may be in that position. So a, a couple of things. Number one, in 2018, when you say you were engaging uh, realtors and looking at potential sites, but it sounds like um, what you said is that they were just too expensive, and so you weren't you weren't uh, willing to pursue those. Is that that's accurate? a fair characterization? But also in 2018, I indicated we were having 2018. We were having uh, conversations with Savannah, or trying to have conversations with Savannah to stay there as well. So we were right. talking about where we are currently with Court Square and even going to the second floor or other floors. And then, and I may mispronounce the name, uh, Savannah and others mentioned the Fauci building. Is that the Fauci, Fauci? Yeah. And then you and I, I think, or Matt and I talked about that, whether that was in the catchment area and we were- We do not believe it is. So, right, we did so. not agree that it was. So we even went to that level of talking to you about that building being outside of the catchment right. area. So. Uh, so a couple of things. I want to talk about uh, the Taver site because uh, if we all believed that a public library was in danger of closing, then indeed there would be a full court press and we would be pursuing multiple angles and multiple directions at the same time, all to avoid the very thing that's going to happen in a couple of days, which is a library closing. And that's precisely why when Tavros approached me about a building that they were building literally across the street from this site, uh, and because they actually wanted to lower the height of the building mm -hmm. and change the density of the building, they needed uh, approval from this council. I said to them, while the library is looking at uh, a potential loss of its lease, and we are pursuing lots of other angles, uh, it's incumbent upon me as the council member who cares very much about libraries and this particular library to say to you, uh, I want you to work with the Queen's Public Library and find uh, a way to have a potential permanent library uh, directly across the street from where this library is. And because of that, they did engage you and there was uh, and is still, uh, I would hope, the uh, possibility of having a permanent and larger Court Square Library in that building. But that was never uh, meant to stop or curtail any of the efforts to find a replacement for this rental. Indeed, mm -hmm. what I always expected was that uh, while we were waiting for the Tavros build out, that we would have uh, another location uh, where the library would rent until we were able to move into the permanent location that I had uh, hopefully secured. We're in total agreement about that. I mean, if I said anything to convey that I wasn't in agreement with that, so we were looking for other space, knowing that the Tavros deal was sometime off in the future. And when you talk about permanent space, it's still permanent space that we would be paying for. That's but right. The, so I just want to be clear that we are in agreement that while Tavros was a nice deal, but that deal, they haven't even broken ground yet. And so we would also, we would also have to pay money in the build out. So part of the deal with Tavros is that they would make certain contribution to the library, but we would still be ponying up dollars out of the expense side for the build out. And so then, if I may, just one more point with that. So that also, is because it's important, as you asked about context, to put in context, and I said this to a group, I think, last week, uh, that in the ideal world, I would only really like to build out one time because a build out can cost up to a million dollars. And having that type of expense money of building out with Tavros a good deal 
I still, with a short-term type of deal, especially if it's a short-term deal waiting for Tavros, which may not become a reality for four years, and it's tough to negotiate a reasonable lease for a four to five year period of time. So those are the pieces that I was balancing as far as a short-term deal or lease until the Tavros deal became reality. So I understand that, but in hearing you even say that you only want one build out, and I understand Ideally. why that is ideal, it reminds me of something I said at the opening, which is this nagging feeling, and I think that some in the community have, that you as the president and CEO, but also uh, the Queen's Public Library, um, were okay with this library closing uh, as opposed to, to other uh, more expensive options. And, and I think there is this nagging feeling that while there were some efforts uh, to find a space that you deem affordable, uh, ultimately, the library came to the decision that allowing this library to close and lapse was an acceptable way to go. Is that? I totally disagree with it. I mean, I, if I could find a space to have it be concurrent to uh, the closing of this particular space and opening up right away, I would do that. I mean, it's, I think it's ludicrous to think that we want Court Square to close. That's not true. I think the reality is, and I have a fiduciary responsibility, and I can't undersell that, because I do not want my future successor, whenever that may be, to say, what was Walcott thinking in signing off on a deal that is going to strap this library in the future? So I have that responsibility. I'd rather take the short-term heat than deal with a long-term fiscal implication that's wrong for the library, and I want to do the right thing for the library. But if I could find a space for Court Square and that space can be signed just like that, I would do that. And so my goal would be in the ideal world, even with the Tavros deal out there, is to find a deal where I can have a 10 and 10 you know, year lease with uh, a price per square that's relatively reasonable, at the same time factoring in the build out that carries out because we can't use the capital money for this. So it would have to be expense money. And then have expense money, say, up to a million dollars for a five-year period of time while we're waiting for the Tavros deal to become real, then that's something that's not fiscally responsible. But if I could find that balancing act, and I think, as you well know, sir, that we looked at alternative spaces as well. Uh, we talked to a number of sites as far as possibly co-joining with them and looking, and unfortunately that didn't materialize either. So I think it's pretty important for me to convey both to you, to the members of the council, and to the public, that if I could have the court square lease in at X point and then start a new lease without any gap, I would love to have done that. So, but we didn't get that. and. And I understand right. you have a fiduciary responsibility to the Queen's Public Library, but you also have an obligation to the people of Court Square, uh, an obligation to provide continuous library service uh, to the tens of thousands of people who live there, to the children. Um, and, and that, to me, uh, is paramount, particularly when you look at the funding data that I talked about earlier. Um, and that is who is being failed here, uh, the people of the Court Square neighborhood, uh, the children who live in that community, uh, all of those babies that you and I have seen many times who are going to story time, mm -hmm. uh, all of those families uh, are not going to have a public library. And that is unacceptable, particularly when you look at the numbers that I cited. And what I uh, fail to understand uh, and find unacceptable is how the library, knowing that this deadline was staring at you, uh, didn't take some of that um, uh, increase and, and, and set it aside, that there wasn't already, well in advance of this moment, uh, both a private and public fundraising drive to make sure that we could and had to, we really had to, there was no choice, 
See, that's the thing. I think the library accepted the choice that closing was uh, uh, maybe an evil but a necessary evil. Whereas I would say, given the resources, given the time you had, you didn't even have to face that choice, nor should you have ever thought that was an acceptable, necessary evil to close the library. Because had you done all of that planning and had you said, we're going to take some of this expense money, not capital, we're talking about expense money, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if the foundation has been engaged, your private fundraising arm has been engaged at all on this um, to make sure that we had the resources, uh, to make sure that we had at least a rental, that we had at least a trailer. We don't even have that. You have the bus going out one day a week. One day a week, that's unacceptable. That's absolutely outrageous. In this city, in this moment, with this much money in your budget, that we would have Court Square having a bus going one day a week, when in truth, you had the time, you had the resources, and I am interested, and I will ask you about what the Queens Library Foundation or your fundraising arm did on the private side to see if you could get some funding to actually make sure that we had, at a minimum, a trailer out there somewhere in Long Island City that could provide a space uh, that would require, uh, that would allow the community to have a library space. Sure, so let me respond to a couple of things. One, I mean, we just see it a little differently uh, in that we have done a tremendous amount of work of trying to find space. And while you think, and correctly so, that we have a lot of money, you cannot guarantee me that that money will not be there in the future. And I look forward and always appreciate, and I don't want to even under, uh, make an undersell of this particular point, your leadership around libraries in general, not just Queens, but libraries in New York City. It's been fantastic, and we truly value that. But at the same time, I can't guarantee five years out from now, even with money that's baseline, because what you did not talk about is the expenses that have gone up, the health care that's gone up, and other expenses that have gone up to respond to that money that has been used, how we've invested the money in collections, how we've invested the money in more librarians, and we have invested that money. It's not like we have money sitting idly by, and therefore I can just have that money go into uh, the Queens Public Library Court Square Library. So I just want to make sure that the public and we all understand that we've had a wise investment of that money, and we'll talk about it even in more length when it's time for the prelim budget. So that's been utilized well. As far as the foundation is concerned, the foundation is raising money, but again, we're still recovering in the raising of money from the past. And so we're building our uh, unrestricted revenue, uh, but it's not going to be solely devoted to Court Square. And my goal is to make sure we have Court Square in place with money coming in, both whether it's from the foundation or whether it's from um, the government to pay for us moving out in the out years. We've devoted a lot of the foundation resources, as you well know also, in Hunter's Point. And Hunter's Point got a million dollar grant, and we have a lot of money from the foundation that's being raised and focused around Hunter's Point. So we're having the foundation take a look at a variety of needs. We met with a funder yesterday and walking around and talking about potential options. So we're always laying out options. Where I may have been mistaken, and I will own this, is thinking of the benevolence of others as far as saying, oh, we're a library, let us come forward and try to be helpful. And then we haven't gotten that type of response, per se, say from the corporate sector, but we've reached out to private industry as well uh, to try to get them to understand the importance of a library and you know, donating space or giving some space. So we continue to pursue that, and we will always pursue that, but again, the money that has been increased that you cited has been utilized extremely well and wisely for the benefit of all of our libraries throughout the borough. Right, but not Court Square. Uh, Court Square has benefited as well, but not necessarily Court Square moving forward because I can't guarantee what's going to be in the future as far as the so price for Square. You, you, you made that case a couple of times, and I just I want have. to say, and as you know, uh, uh, maybe other than Nick Buron, no one in this room has been involved with the Queens Public Library longer than me and been involved in these budget cycles, right? This is my 22nd year, either working for the Queens Public Library or being chair of this committee. Uh, and no one knows better than me that even if we baseline funding for libraries, there are variations and there are dips in the economy yeah. and we are subject to those realities. But I would say that the library has had several 
least libraries throughout the entire time uh, uh, that I am associated with uh, this uh, institution. And whether we were in good budget times or bad budget times, uh, the library didn't cancel the leases or stop paying for those community libraries. Indeed, it kept them all open um, uh, no matter where we were with the budget cycle. So you're citing, you know, uh, despite the fact that we've baselined uh, now almost $120 million of the Queens Public Library's budget, that, well, that could dip at some point, and, and therefore I can't enter into a lease uh, for Court Square uh, that I think is too expensive because we might see a dip in funding at some point. But you have several other uh, existing leases mm -hmm. at libraries, and yet you continue all of those despite the fact that funding could dip at some point in the future for the library. I'm just saying that again, it, it very much seems to me that you as the president and CEO of the library uh, uh, have made the, the conscious choice um, and or the library didn't secure uh, enough private support or take some of this funding um, to set it aside so that we could have a rainy day fund for the Court Square Library to make sure that we were continuing service there. So I asked you before if the foundation had done any specific fundraising for this over the last two years. Has no, they not necessarily specifically for this. Right. And but the foundation hasn't done anything specifically for a particular library as far as the lease is concerned, but I mean, to answer but you directly. But it could have if you would ask them to. They've, t yes. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Right? They could. You, you are the president and CEO of the library, and you, uh, I, I believe the foundation. Uh, I take all responsibility for every decision that's made at the you, library. So, so you could have gone to the head of the foundation and said, we have this uh, lease expiring, we have uh, and we anticipate a need for some additional funding to pay for potentially leasing out a space or having a trailer and, and could you go out there and see if we can get some uh, private foundation philanthropic support to make sure that the money is there in the unfortunate event that we are in fact evicted as we will be on Saturday. I'm just saying that was a possible That's thing a that theoretical po done. possibility, but at the same time, as you well know, having been on the side of the library as well as fundraising, even with private fundraising, one cannot guarantee funding in out years. And you know that. And so as a result of that, could we have raised some money that can be specifically targeted for court switch? Possible. Could we guarantee that money would be in out years and therefore I'm signing a lease for whatever period of time based on speculation? I wouldn't do that. I so, wouldn't do that to Queens Public Library. And at the same time, being committed to Court Square. And going back to your point around the other lease sites, when you have a price differential of roughly $60, $60 per square foot of our most expensive lease compared to what the Court Square market is uh, showing at this particular point, that's a heck of a price differential. And with those lease sites that we have, it ranges roughly, and don't hold me to this exactly, but roughly uh, $15 per square to roughly $35 per square. And that's a realistic price for us to have. So let me ask you, uh, in all honesty, do you believe- I've been honest nonstop. Uh, do you believe, uh, I phrased the question, let me ask you in all okay, honesty. Okay, but no, I mean, I don't want to, in all honesty, I mean, I'm, Actually, I've been honest in every response honesty. that I give. Uh, so let me rephrase the question, but say the same thing. Let me ask in all honesty, uh -huh. that's what I said. Uh, do you believe that the Queens Public Library could have and should have done something sooner to avoid this moment? No, and I'll tell you why I said no, because I think we did just about everything we needed to do to try to find space. Again, it's not that I made a conscious decision to say, oh, we don't want to be in Savannah Building or the Court Square Building. Savannah made a conscious decision, and we, and, and, and we pursued- Everyone agrees with that. Yeah, Everyone but the burden is shifting like we haven't done our due diligence. We did our due diligence. We look for space. We talked to Savannah. We talked to Amazon. We talked to Centene. We've talked to the private industry in the area as well. We've reached out to brokers. We changed brokers. We became uh, engaged with several properties, especially that may be worthwhile for us to pursue, and we are continuing to pursue those properties. So I think we did everything that we had to do uh, at the particular point of where we are right now. 
Uh, I, I fundamentally disagree with that. I know that. you do. I know. fundamentally disagree with that because what you had to fundamentally do was keep this library functioning for this community. That is what you ultimately had to do um, and not allow a library to close uh, in Court Square. And, and so therefore, uh, and I'm shocked. I mean, I really honestly thought that you would say, you know, we, we did everything we could, but in hindsight, we could have started earlier. We could have actually uh, done this. We could have actually done that. You know, can, so I, can I just one second with that point, if I may? In that, you know, I thought about that in preparing for our discussion today, and we could have started four years ago, and I'm not sure that would have made a difference to be where we are right now. I mean, it's just we're caught in a, caught in a vise of looking for space, a price point being extremely high, being conscious of a budget moving forward, and factoring all those things in along with our commitment to maintaining a court square library. And I'm not going to be held, I'm not going to allow the Queen's Public Library to be held hostage by a price per square that would potentially hurt the library in the long run. I just can't do that. And so like I said to you, I will take the short-term heat and I take the responsibility for it. But at the same time, I am fully committed to having a long-term plan to making sure that we have a court square library. But we just see it differently and I understand that. Look, I, I've heard you say that a few times. I will say it again. I would prefer to hear you say that I will not disenfranchise the people of Court Square, as long as I'm the present CEO of the Queen's Library, that you can both be uh, uh, prudent uh, and be a, a prudent fiscal uh, uh, steward of the public library dollars, but also say, um, you know, not on my watch, like we'll find some way, we'll find a way uh, to make sure that we have continuous public library service, which gets me to uh, a trailer. Obviously, having Did you say, I'm sorry, trailer? A trailer. Okay. Right? I mean, so I've, uh -huh. I've worked at the library uh, for 11 years when libraries were uh, being rebuilt, uh, when a new branch was being built, uh, when significant uh, um, alterations were being made that rendered the library unusable for longer, let's say, than six months at a time. The library would often uh, put a, uh, a series, uh, one or two trailers together, that would actually make uh, a small but legitimate and functioning library service for the community. Um, we did that in multiple, multiple locations. Most recently we did it at um, Elmhurst. Right, because, and because the library rightfully said that while building a new library uh, was absolutely the right thing to do and an imperative, it was unacceptable to close the library altogether for a period that was longer than several months, right? You couldn't leave a library in Queens, uh, a community in Queens without a public library. So when those extended uh, periods happened where a building was being torn down, a new building was being built, the library would make that investment and, and erect a couple of trailers and have a library. Did you consider that for this location? And if so, what happened? And if you didn't, why not? So as you sh probably know, Chair, is that with those scenarios that you laid out, those trailers are capitally eligible. And there's a big difference of that versus the expense money. And so again, and I'll defer to the people who are better at this than I am, that when you are building out, say, Elmhurst or others, uh, you have capitally eligible money to allow you to have that bridge between the tearing down, the renovation of a library, and then the restart of that library to fill that gap. And so that is a key distinction. And right now, with the trailer, if I had made a commitment of a trailer, then that really doesn't allow, it will not allow me to, from a financial point of view, to hopefully sign a lease with a potential landlord on space either to tie me into Tavros or with the goal of having a long-term lease to have a library of the future. So the capitally eligible part for this particular scenario, since it's not as a result of construction, 
would not be available to me, which is available under the scenarios that you laid out. You, you could have asked for capital funding for, for this. Mm, not that I'm aware of. I, I don't think so. So I, I, And we can have our folks check. I don't think that something like this would be capitally eligible. I don't think. But in those other cases, it was capital dollars that paid for the trailer. Because we were doing renovation work of an existing structure. I understand that. No, so capital, I'm saying that's the, that's the key difference. But capital dollars were used in the past for trailers. I haven't disagreed with that, yeah. Right. So what I'm saying is that the library system could have asked me or the council or the mayor for capital funding uh, last year that then might have been able to be used for no, a trailer. No, because as I understand it, that it would not be capitally eligible. It's not, I'm not saying that we didn't have the capital money it would not be capitally eligible, which is a big difference. Well, I, I think we may have a, a disagreement and there may be a, a lack of clarity on it. We can double check on that, but that's my in interpretation, impression. Again, I believe that if the will were there. The will is here, sir. But it, it wasn't because you didn't seriously pursue a, a trailer um, and and, and, and or the funding for the trailer. Um, again, just leaving in the, this position where we don't have anything. Um, so uh, let me ask you about, um, and I, I know at least one of my colleagues uh, may have, have questions, uh, and we'll, we'll get to that and then I'll come back, but your, uh, your ongoing discussions about a potential site. Here. Mm -hmm. Uh, potential rental site. Uh, what's the latest on that? And what kind of time frame can you give the people of Court Square, not just in terms of when you might sign a lease? Because you might be able to say, uh, although I'd like to hear uh, the exact time frame, we could sign a lease in the next couple of weeks. But as we all know, that doesn't mean the people of Court Square will have a library in a couple of weeks, right? There will be a protracted period of time where there will still be no library. So what's the absolute latest real-time deadlines, uh, real-time dates and, and expectations of when this community could expect a library? Because I'm sure you would understand the community's frustration and mine mm -hmm. that if, if we just keep saying we don't know, we, you know, we can't give you a date when you might get a library again, you're essentially not going to have library service for an indefinite period of time. Uh, that's that's frustrating and infuriating uh, for lots of people. So, what can you tell the committee and the community about where you're at? Because you were close when we had the meeting about a month ago at the Court Square Library as well. You had identified that site that you the talked one about I talked about with the contiguous space with the yeah. adjoining spaces. Mm -hmm. It's about it's a month later. Are we closer? Uh, um, to signing a lease, and then what is the time frame or the projected time frame to actually build that space out and give us library service once again in Court Square? So a um, couple of points. One, to totally agree with you, I understand the frustration and the anger on the part of you, members of the committee, and especially the public. So I truly understand that. Uh, two, I think the devil is in the details as far as depending on the space itself. Uh, for example, uh, we have uh, our folks going out to a space within the next week or so, which will involve our capital people taking a look at it as far as the potential build out, and they'll get back to me as far as how long they think it will take to build out the spot that we're looking at. And then I will make decisions based on the options available to me that uh, both, again, goes back to the point of making, making financial uh, sense, but also how much it would cost to build out. So, and I, I think it's important for me to give context as well. So, as you know, some of the spaces are, not the specific spaces, but some of the spaces are different sizes and shapes and have issues. We have a space that we liked, but it does not have bathrooms. So factoring in the build out will factor in the bathrooms. Uh, we had some space that we liked, but then 
didn't meet the ADA requirements that we felt were important. So we ruled that out. So to say to the public right now a definitive timeline, that I cannot do. It is my hope to have a court square library in place by the end of this calendar year. A renovated, renovated a built out library uh, by the end of this calendar year. So that factors in a required amount of time for building out, it requires the amount of time for going through the negotiations and signing the lease, and that's my goal of what we're shooting for right now. So have you made uh, progress, and you recall the meeting that I'm talking about at the library with the friends mm -hmm. of Court Square, because uh, we had very similar discussions that day at the library. Uh, have you made any progress? Are we closer to a deal with any of these uh, potential sites, or wanna... are we in the exact same place and have had no forward movement since that day? Put it like this, if this hearing was held next month, the hearing wouldn't be necessary as far as saying we're closer or not. I think by next month, I will have a definite idea of having a deal in place. And so that's my hope to have something resolved by next month uh, as far as a lease agreement. Uh, but again, the devil's in the detail. And then once, if we do have a deal in place by next month, uh, then it's the amount of time of the build out that will go into that. So my people are looking at uh, a potential space that I may be referring to um, to see what it would take to build that space out to be a functioning library. And this may happen sooner than later. So again, I can't give you a definitive timeline because then you never know what happens in negotiations and I'm not gonna negotiate through us here and the press itself and the public. And that undermines my ability to negotiate a good deal for the library. I certainly understand I uh, uh -huh. not negotiating in public and not negotiating against yourself, uh, but obviously there does need to be uh, some level of transparency Understood. and, and uh, accountability to the community. Uh, we've been joined by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo of the uh, committee, and uh, needless to say, I have more questions, but I think Councilmember Jonai uh, has questions or no? Yep, uh, Councilmember Jonai. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, President Walcott. Um, again, I find myself in a unique position based on my background to be helpful during this hearing. I was a broker at one point when in my past life before I became a public servant. And having had gone through this painful experience myself, whether it be for a private entity or a public one, I can, atte I can attest to the fact that I've worked on deals for years to find out that they won't close or that they do close. And I just want to share with you some of my thoughts on the million dollar build out potential for $3,600, President Walcott. Sounds extremely low based on the numbers I've heard when it comes to libraries. That would be at about $278 a square foot. And I've heard numbers of two and three times that when it comes to build outs. Um, I won't hold my breath on that number. And that's only through what I've seen and witnessed myself. But I do have some questions here as far as, uh, and I do understand the, the price per square foot concerns, and it's about a juggling act as well. Um, and Chairman, I share this with you. Many times, a broker tries to balance between the anticipated close date and the anticipated opening date, so there is not a double rent being paid. We have to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. I commend you on being a good steward of taxpayer dollars. It's easy to be able to pay for two locations simultaneously and perhaps not offering the services as you wind down one to open up the other, which is a complete injustice. And I'm mindful that we don't look for temporary places, but we look for permanent and the best possible options which from day to day, hour to hour, Chairman, can actually change. Because you have to wait for a vacancy to come up. You have to negotiate with a current property owner um, on the availability dates 
and the cost factors, which you can't approve until you get a uh, RFP, I believe, uh, to determine the bidding process of the cost for the build-out, which won't be known until there is a walkthrough and you have your estimators look into the actual cost of relocation. I'm summing all of this up, and I apologize, I want to get to my question. Because I think there's also then, you know, the 900-pound gorilla in the room that's not being talked about, and I'm trying to read between the lines. Am I to understand that this was a done deal in negotiations that were being done with the once was the Amazon deal, and it was part of a footprint and a play that Amazon was going to build out this library? Is that what I'm understanding here? I can't say it was a done deal at all. I would not make that type of statement. I would say that we were in conversations with Amazon around a potential library and other support from Amazon as well for the Queens Public Library. We had a lengthy meeting with a number of the vice presidents, uh, as I indicated earlier, uh, in our Long Island City Library uh, with Amazon. And then we've had uh, several phone conversations as well. So to say it was a done deal, I think, would be misrepresenting how far it was. But, but I think there were conversations with Amazon, as well as with Savannah and Centene and others, as things evolved over a period of time. So there was a there was a conversation of potential uh, role that Amazon would play possibly in involving this particular library. That is correct, and which I understand now. So it's not about a delay with intent of, and then since then, obviously the painful task of locating a space to accommodate on size and location and time frame, uh, just added because I would imagine it's been what eight months or so now that. The Amazon deal has fallen apart. We no longer rely on that deal uh, or the conversation. Exactly a year. I was going to say, it's a year, exactly it's a, year. It's a year this um, month, if not Valentine's Day. Friday is Valentine's Day. But this is, this is to be fair, there was no guarantee. Oh, they, I said that. They, they walked away. Uh, and, and that is not, in all due respect, Council Member, this is my district, this is my library why we're in this position, right? That is not what happened here, and I'm not gonna allow that to be the narrative. Um, uh, we had this knowledge that Savannah was going to throw the library out, essentially, a couple of years ago, and there were lots of different negotiations, um, and all of them fell through for one reason or another, but uh, the truth is the uh, library should still have been uh, a priority in terms of keeping it open, regardless of whether or not any of those things happen. So uh, I just want to uh, correct that, that record. Um, and this is not uh, an Amazon HQ2 hearing, right? This is about the Court Square Library and what the library uh, was done. And you, you don't have this information, Council Member Joe and I, but the friends of the Court Square Library are going to speak right after. President Walcott, and uh, there is a timeline involved here uh, where the library, uh, I believe, can and should have done a lot more uh, to keep this library open and continuous library service happening, and, uh, and that simply didn't happen. Um, and, and I think that is incredibly important uh, to me uh, and to the community uh, who will be speaking shortly um, about what happened here. Um, so. Can I? Yeah, I think we're uh, close to moving on, but if you have another thing you'd like to say, Council Member? I do. Thank you okay. for the courtesy, Chairman. Sure. And I was leading to, um, on the eve of the anniversary of Valentine's Day, where my heart and the hearts of many New Yorkers was broken over the Amazon deal, I felt that it was appropriate to bring up, and I'm not making this an Amazon hearing, uh, but knowing that in my own experience, a negotiation is a negotiation until it's either signed or it falls apart. And I wanted to point that out, that this was all part of it. And the disservice of having a public library or a vital city service not being provided to a community that they've enjoyed is a disservice. So we're trying to get ahead of this. And I'm just going to ask you out straight, Mr. Walcott, on sure. the current lease. Are you considering holdovers? Uh, holdover stay, that is, that although you don't have a lease and it may have expired and you're supposed to close uh, and move out, there are certain laws that protect um, 
you as a tenant, in this case the city of New York, for, for being forced out through a holdover provision, which I believe is typically typical in city contracts. Um, I'm not familiar with that provision. All I know is that our lease, we are a sublease of Citibank, which is leasing now the space in the Savannah building itself. So our agreement with Citibank was extended until March 31st of this year. And so for us to meet the requirements of our sublease with Citi is a reason why we have to uh, close out services as of uh, this Saturday will be the last day because then we have to make sure the facility is suitable for city because then city has an obligation to Savannah as a tenant of Savannah. So knowing a little bit about this as well, mm -hmm. there is a provision as a holdover. So although your lease expires, although you intended to move out and due to unforeseen circumstances, Chairman, and this is important to know, you could still remain in that property for a duration of time and allow for a court proceeding or allow for an additional agreement, an extension of time to be accommodated to both the public library and the needs of the community with the landlord in place. You do not have to vacate. No one is going to lock you out. It's illegal. No one is going to take your stuff and put it into storage or put it into garbage. You can legally be a holdover occupant of the space until you work this out with the landlord or a court order determines otherwise. And I would encourage that perhaps this is the path that we should take to keep the library open in the interim providing a service to the community and being good stewards of, ta of taxpayer dollars so don't, we don't spend our limited resources unwisely. Okay, we'll have our council review. I, 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 I'm not an expert and my council is no longer my council who you're looking is, at. So. Is that something that you all are familiar with or have looked into uh, it all or well, heard of? I can tell you from a Chairman, I'm certain of this law. Yes, no, I understand. It would I'm be just like you as a tenant. If you didn't pay your rent, no landlord could come in and evict you, even Let's, though it's commercial. You still have protections. No, I got you. I, uh, and I appreciate yeah, that. I'm just, uh, I don't know if the general counsel here is from the library, but certainly the CEO. Former general is, counsel. Right? Former general counsel of the library. Former general counsel? Chief operating officer. Right. Now. So uh, what Sung said to me, my chief operating officer, that then we would get into litigation with Citibank, and Citibank has been four square with us as far as extending the sublease. Um, and I have no desire to uh, expend library money in litigation with Citibank, but we will do our due diligence. But we are sublease E of City, and City has its own provisions, which I'm not familiar with, with Savannah as far as the major leaseholder in the building. But we, we'll double check. I'm not familiar with that. President Walcott, I assure you okay. there is a provision and protections that you have that you need to explore. And I know that no one wants to go down the avenue of um, going through court hearings and proceedings. You are within your rights as a sublease tenant okay. to do so. We'll double check. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, so, Dennis, you guys will pursue that and uh, let us know um, about that potential avenue that uh, we we may have just learned about. Um, so, I want to um, uh, ask again if if you don't think that there was anything that, that you or the Queens Public Library could have done differently here to maintain continuous library service. Um, you know, we've had many conversations mm -hmm. and, uh, in, in the past, and I think even at that public meeting with the Friends of the Court Square Library, there was at, at least some acknowledgement that uh, things could have been done differently or maybe uh, the library could have 
uh, responded more quickly or been, uh, well, at a minimum, certainly communicating better with the community. But, yeah. but, but I'm a little surprised today to hear you say, no, we, we did everything we could have and correctly and timely. And, and so I'll pick up on a point that I've you I've heard made. you say I'm other sorry. things, so I'm a little confused. When you said you heard me say other things, such as? You know, I thought at that uh, Friends of the Court Square Library, there was an acknowledgement that, yeah, maybe we could have uh, uh, acted more quickly here or, or jumped in more quickly. And, and, um, and there was, there was uh, you know, a, a sense that both while you had a commitment to this community, um, there was also the acknowledgement that, that uh, all was not, in fact, done, and certainly not done as quickly as it could have been um, from jump, and, and I think that is a, that is a difference uh, so, of I, I, approach I, today. I think the difference is, well, two things. One, and I didn't say this before, I could have done a lot better in communicating to the community, so that I do acknowledge uh, now. And as far as the point that you're raising, again, as I said a little while ago, as I really did a lot of soul searching and said, if I did something three years ago, would we be in any different position? I don't think so. And I did a lot of, had put a lot of thought to that. And it's not to just move away from responsibility. I accept every bit of responsibility as the head of the Queens Public Library. But the positions that we're in, the, it's just based on the marketplace and based on those circumstances that I have tried to respond to. And so in that context, uh, should we have been out front on this three years ago? Maybe, but then I don't know if that would make any major difference right now because it is what it is and I have a responsibility to rectify the what is now so moving forward into the future there's a permanent court square library in place. So uh, and uh, we want to hear from the, the community members who have been mm -hmm. uh, waiting I don't know if you'll uh, hang around to hear them. Folks will be here. Uh, okay. uh, speak but um, the uh, there are vast differences in all of our communities in Queens, as mm -hmm. we all know, and uh, I believe you have 64 uh, library branches at this 66 point. 66 facilities and 64 of them are libraries. Right. Because uh, Queensbridge was a library that then became the tech center. That's right, and Ravenswood Back in well. 2007, um, right. But, and, and there are great differences, and, and you know, and. Long Island City is very unique. Court Square is, is very unique even within Long Island City. Um, but my, my last question to you is, uh, the people in Court Square uh, deserve a library, mm -hmm. um, need a library. Um, and, uh, and this public library system, and you as the president and CEO, um, will make sure that they have a library? That's a question, and the answer is yes. I've said that from the beginning, middle, and the end. I am committed, and I will look at the people from Court Square to say it directly to them, uh, to having a Court Square library. And so that is my commitment here in testimony and here in conversation and in our actions in pursuing various potential deals as far as trying to find a situation that will allow me to finalize a deal. And hopefully I'll be able to uh, have a deal in place very soon. So I, I uh, heard you talk about the uh, hopeful April uh, um, announcement if there should be one and and the uh, um, timeline of having a, a newly uh, uh, renovated space by the end of this calendar year uh -huh. um, uh, both that's of those. the goal yes sir uh, and uh, and and obviously we are not disinterested in, in making sure that those things happen uh, I, I think we should have never gotten to this point but um, we have to make sure that uh, we don't get here again anywhere else in Queens or the city of New York with respect to a library and um, stipulating that Court Square 
uh, deserves a library, needs a library, and will always have a library um, is absolutely essential to me and uh, to all the folks who are about to testify, I am sure. And to me as well, sir. Um, so with that, I want to uh, uh, thank uh, Mr. Walcott Ooh. for uh, being here and call Megan Cerrito from the Friends of the Court Square Library, uh, Frank Wu uh, from the Court Square Civic Association, and uh, Mary Jo Beta, uh, a resident of Long Island City. Mary, are you going to join? We're going to do one panel of community members who are going to testify. Megan will go first, then Frank, and then Mary. Um, I know we have a three-minute uh, uh, clock, um, but we will be somewhat liberal uh, in our interpretation of that. And uh, Mary, do you have written testimony? Do you have written testimony? Are you submitting testimony? You're just going to speak from the heart? Okay. Um, great. So, um, Megan, when you are ready. And this is Frank's as well. Thank you. Thank you to the New York City Council and the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations for inviting me to testify today regarding Queens Public Library at Court Square. My name is Megan Cerrito, and I am the president of the Friends of Court Square Library. I am also a mother, public education advocate, proud resident of Queens, and former public librarian. All of the hats I wear will inform my testimony today. As a child, the public library was both the cornerstone of my education and a free and open place for my mom to bring me and my sisters while my dad worked 24-hour shifts as a firefighter. Now, as a mother myself, the public library has been a gathering place for my family and center of early literacy for my sons. As a resident of Queens, Hunters Point, and Court Square in particular, the public library has been a free and open gathering space in a neighborhood bristling with glass residential towers. Court Square Library is our community center. As a public librarian, I could tell you countless stories of conducting story times where babies and toddlers began to bridge the 30 million word gap, of new Americans attending English language learners classes, of seniors finding fellowship along with large print books, and teens meeting with a social worker for assistance in understanding. I think we can all recall important moments in our lives that took place in the public library. I think we can all acknowledge that it is fundamentally a bedrock of democracy. But nostalgia won't save Court Square Library. I am not here today to testify to the value of public libraries. I am here today to testify to the value of the public library in Court Square. I am here to ask this committee what went wrong and how we can fix it. I am here as a canary in a coal mine. If Court Square Library can be closed, no branch library throughout New York City is safe. Today I will address two important points to which all New Yorkers should pay close attention. Number one, what events and decisions led to the closure of Court Square Library over the past several years? And number two, how can the closure be prevented now? The Friends of Court Square Library have spent the last two years attempting to work with Queens Public Library to prevent the closure of Court Square Library. And I think that Courts, uh, Queens Public Library's overall um, attitude towards the Friends and other advocates can be seen in Mr. Walcott's testimony this morning and the paragraph that he submitted. We have been rebuffed and ignored at every turn. We are outraged as we have watched opportunity after opportunity squandered to save the library. Mr. Walcott has spoken about his fiduciary duty to Queens Public Library, 
but he also has a duty of service to queens. I contend that Mr. Walcott and his staff are derelict in their duties of providing library service. The city building lease is expiring, which we all knew years ago. They have had plenty of time to find a solution, and despite our persistent outreach, they have failed to do so. Queen's Public Library failed in evaluating the Court Square community in taking note of the booming residential development and robust community. They have actively ignored a workforce that has been courted by the Economic Development Corporation to come to Long Island City each day to work, eat, and use public services. They have failed at the very basic understanding that public library service is vital to all New Yorkers. I ask the committee today to evaluate the decision making that has forced us all to gather here today in haste and with emotions on high. This library is closing in three days. And consider legislation that provides greater oversight of the public library systems and their ability to unilaterally close a public library. If it can happen in Court Square, it can happen in your district too. I do not give a damn about Amazon. I have seen reporting and spoken to officials who claim the closure of Court Square Library is the result of Amazon's departure from Long Island City. That claim is absurd. Vital community services like public libraries surely do not close because a private company is no longer a tenant in the shared building. Surely there is enough political will in this room, in this building, to keep a public library open. I reject outright that Amazon is either the cause of the closure or would have been its savior. Today is the day we get to save this library. I am looking at all of you to be the ones to do it, but you should ask why Queens Public Library left it to you. To that end, I want to assure you that I am willing to beg today. I will cry, I will implore you. Public library service is so deeply important to me and this community that I will get, gladly put my ego and my anger to the side and ask you to please, please help our community find a solution today. Please join me in the creative problem solving and deal making that should have been done years ago. Please add your voice to the chorus of encouragement to Savannah in asking them to extend the library's lease. Please ask the City Planning Commission to tell David and Jerry Walkoff that their five points development cannot open if they do not work with the community and cite a library. Please ask the School Construction Authority and the Department of Design and Construction to consider building a school with a public library on site in Court Square. There are solutions. There has to be the will. Please join New Yorkers in saying we will not allow public libraries to close in New York City. Actions speak louder than words, so this question I leave with you today is this. How can we save Courseware Library from the inaction and ineptitude of Queens Public Library? Thank you for allowing my testimony today. Thank you, Megan, for your passion, uh, number one. and. Few people understand uh, the value of a public library more than you. Thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to thank you for fighting, and I think you saw, uh, which I rarely do here in the chamber, I have quite a bit of anger about this as well. Mm -hmm. and, um, and indeed, you know, tried to get from uh, Dennis Walcott the acknowledgement that if there was the will to keep this library open at the Queens Public Library, it could have and would have been done yes. actually fairly easily. I agree. Because as we increased the budget to the Queens Public Library alone uh, by $7 million last year, um, no one at the Queens Public Library asked me or anyone else for any specific or dedicated funding to keep this library open. If you, and you know me, if someone had come to me and said, in the face of this record funding, we need 
200,000, 400,000, 600,000, whatever it was to keep this library open, you know I would have done it. Yeah, I, would have found I think that money. every elected official at this point that, uh, you know, we're, that covers Court Square Library has offered support, offered to reach out to Savannah, like yourself, to Tavros to make those deals, and also has offered money. But they didn't ask for it. Correct. And seemingly didn't want it. One and, can only assume. And, and uh, it's outrageous, um, and I share your outrage. And we are talking to all of these people that you outlined here, looking at all of these uh, potential solutions too. Um, but, uh, but we need a willing partner in the Queen's Public Library. Exactly. As well. um, so, uh, so thank you. Um, Frank. <clears throat> So I'm a, I'm a big believer in civil discourse, but I feel like at times like this, there's a reason why in New York City you need angry hordes of people shouting, yelling, having signs. And I think the narrative of this is clearly the lack of leadership and, and aptitude of Queens Public Library. The other council members left, but you know I, I pay a lot of money in taxes. A lot of people in Long Island City do, and they have jobs. And you know we I privately asked Dennis uh, Mr. Walcott saying Long Island City is a privileged community we can easily raise money we raised I think what thirty forty thousand dollars in less than six weeks for New York City rise up and he basically said it's not needed right he publicly said I mean privately said we don't need the money right so the legislative body has clearly done their job but you know the Queens Public Library has not and real leadership is about solving problems and the fact that his testimony was so short he's still not here today speaks volumes real business leadership is about take on the solution and not saying well there are obstacles it's it's hard right the queen's public library is not the head of nitra it's queen's public library right and the answers that he gave today to be honest were very disappointing and i think it creates a lack of um uh, apathy in people in their belief in public institutions and I think as an oversight body, the city council should seriously take a look at that, um, you know, from in terms of, again, his, his response today in terms of where we are. Um, you know, I, I think the solutions that he offered were good, but the interim solution is still not acceptable, the once a week. And again, this is not a political issue. You know, all individuals of political spectrum, rich, poor, young, old, public libraries are a good thing. And the fact that the leadership of the Queen's Public Library cannot seem to get that, and he comes off as more of a CEO, talking about financial management, as opposed to their formal goal, which is to create inclusive space for all people, um, I think there is a large disconnect. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Frank. And I think uh, uh, you saw, I mean, I have, I have been the chair of this committee for 10 years and two months. Uh, before that, I worked for the Queen's Public Library for 11 years, and I wrote these things, right? I was the one who drafted the testimony for whoever was the president and CEO of the library for 11 years. I drafted every single testimony. I have never seen anything like this, um, never. Um, and I'm shocked, um, and I have uh, worked with uh, uh, Mr. Walcott in many different ways, but, but I, this is unacceptable uh, because um, we all know what an oversight hearing is and we all know what's expected of folks who testify, um, and that is to share all of the relevant information that you have with respect to the closure of the Court Square Library. This is clearly not all of the relevant information relative to what has happened here. Um, so I am, I am uh, equally outraged. Uh, and we, we did talk about the foundation and what, what if any, uh, work had been done to try and enlist any philanthropies or foundations or any kind of support. And, uh, and Dennis said that none of that happened, right? There was no outreach. There was no attempt to fundraise on the private side at all uh, to, to keep this going, which, again, leads one to believe that there wasn't exactly a full court press here on the part of the Queen's Public Library to keep this library open. Uh, and that is the bottom line. And we won't stop uh, fighting uh, because again, even if, and it's a big if, they announce a lease signing next month, um, 
who knows, right? It is, it is just too much to be left. And I will also say this, in all these 21 uh, years that I've been doing public libraries in Queens, uh, we never let a library close. We never let a community go without library service, which is why I mentioned the trailers, because we have renovated and, and built new libraries in many different locations. But it was always the ethos of the public library system in Queens that we would never strand a library without library service. We would never force a community to go longer than a few months. And in fact, that was sort of the discussion is how long would a closure take place? And if it was going to be of a certain duration, for sure we would put the trailers out there because then the community would have continuous library service. Because, and Megan knows this, attendance at public libraries and participation in public library programs and even uh, uh, the loaning of materials is habit forming, right? People get into a routine. They go to the library on a Monday or Wednesday, right? The children go to that particular program on a Tuesday afternoon or a Friday afternoon. And if you terminate library service altogether, all of those rhythms are stopped, right? All of those rituals end. And then you risk losing those dedicated patrons. You risk losing readers, children who are used to going to that library and getting the books. That's why you kept a trailer so that that child, even though it was a different space, even if it was a smaller space, could still go to that library on the Tuesday afternoon that they were used to going to the library to continue their beginnings of what we like to call lifelong learning. And that's what is lost when you terminate a library um, and uh, allow library service to stop. Um, so thank you, Frank. Uh, Mary? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for holding this hearing and giving me this opportunity to speak. My name is Mary Jovaida. I live next to the Court Square Library, and I have been living there for over 18 years. And I will speak what the library means to the local community. I came here in 2001 as a visitor, as an immigrant who had master education in Bangladesh, and the library opened the door for me. It just gave me empty envelope, told me to write my address and send it to my address, and I brought it back and I became a member. Since then, it has been part of my growing every single year. I, I was a low-income household member, already married, and when I became a mother, now, without finding any jobs, I went to college. And you know the reality of low-income students, who is already a mother. The, I would always borrow the books from the library, because I didn't have the money to buy the books. And that library is good school library. When I became mother of two, I was at NOU, my senior years. I'm in my final days to submit papers. I was the only member of my 11 siblings and my parents all who, left in, who live in Bangladesh still now. I'm the only one who, here. I could not afford any babysitting or anything. I used the library as a de facto babysitting place. I would keep my children busy with the children's material and I would study for my college write my papers using the library books, materials, and computers. I never expected that this thing would happen to my library. That was my family, my babysitting place, my all the resources that developed me from that unknown immigrant young woman to this Mary sitting in front of you. The other day I was coming from the school, picking up my daughter. It was last Friday. And all of a sudden my daughter asked me, Mom, when, when does the library close? So I thought actually she meant when today the library is closing. So I told her it's closing at 6 o'clock. And my daughter said, no, I didn't mean that. And saying that she broke, she started crying. The library means, you know, we do not have any senior centers in the in Court Square. We do not have any youth programs. This is the library that serves the senior center too. Our seniors go there, use the computer, books, magazines, and they build their community and they spend time together there. Our students go there to study, borrow books, to prepare their tests. And if you go any given time, 
to Kursko Library. You can see how many scholars are sitting outside. That shows how many children are using that library. It is totally, at one point, I, f I feel like we all failed here. We all failed. From our elected officials to, a, as a resident I am, to all the community organizations, we all failed. At this time, I only can request you that is there really any, any way to keep, keep the library going across beside our differences in our opinions, in our political identities or anything. We all should come together to save our library that made huge changes in the community. Commun people of color, immigrants and people who do not have families, people who aspire to grow. This library is home for all of them. And I request you, Mr. Council Member, I wish this hearing would have happened six months earlier so we would have enough time to push more. But even though at this deathbed, is there any way, is there any magic bullet, is there any, any way that we can come together to save this library? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mary, for your uh, story and your personal uh, experience with the library and obviously, uh, anyone who's spent more than 30 minutes in Queens knows uh, how immigrant rich we are and how our public library system is the first place where virtually uh, every uh, new immigrant goes to uh, because all of the services are free, uh, no questions asked, it is the most democratic institution, no one asks if you're uh, documented or undocumented, if you're rich or you're poor, everyone comes equally, uh, and, uh, and that's why it's so important to keep libraries open. So uh, I assure you, uh, Mary, that there has been a full court press on from this committee and from my office and the other elected officials for a couple of years, uh, but again, uh, if the Queens Public Library um, isn't as committed to this as they should be, uh, we have a problem. Um, because uh, while we will look at the proposed legislation that uh, Megan mentioned and other ways to increase oversight of this, uh, at this particular moment in time, uh, it is incumbent upon the president and the CEO of the Queens Public Library uh, to sign a lease, uh, to enter into negotiations, and, uh, and to guarantee this community continuous public library service. That did not happen. That has not happened, um, but we will continue to press them to, uh, to do just that. Um, what we heard today was unacceptable on so many levels, um, and, uh, and I, would, I would expect more anguish from the public library itself um, that something like this was going to happen, but, but we didn't get that at all. Um, and you talk about the human story, all of you share the human story, and while everyone here appreciates uh, uh, the fiduciary responsibilities of the public library, everyone here wants taxpayer dollars to be spent wisely, um, but there are few <laughs> better ways to spend taxpayer dollars than on public libraries and then on public library service. Uh, and the fundamental obligation of this public library system to keep this public library open uh, is paramount. And it wasn't here, right? A, a, a um, lack of, of willingness to, to do what it took is what made this moment happen. Um, and, and that could have and should have been uh, avoided. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, and, and I heard Mr. Walcott talk about um, leaving his successors with, um, uh, you know, a, a budget question that he didn't want to leave them with. But if I were president and CEO of the Queens Public Library, I wouldn't want to have on my record that a public library closed on my watch. Right? That, to me, is quite damning. Um, so, uh, 
I, I appreciate your passion um, and uh, all of you, and I know all of us will continue to work together um, to make sure that Court Square gets what it deserves uh, and, and needs and, uh, and that we compel the Queen's Public Library to do the right thing here. I am, no one loves the Queen's Public Library more than me. Um, so everyone in this room, including the people who work for the Queen's Public Library, know how difficult this is. Uh, but I am enormously disappointed in this organization and this institution that I really believe in and that I really love and that I've dedicated 21 years of my life to. Um, that they would allow this to happen is absolutely outrageous and disgraceful. Um, so I want to thank all of you. Uh, recommit to working together with you uh, on this issue. But uh, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come here. Thank you. And with that, uh, we have no further uh, witnesses. Um, I believe I have made very clear what I believe uh, has happened here and what needs to happen. So with that, I want to thank everyone for coming today, and this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>